Welcome to another enlightening episode of The Truth About the Plant, the show that takes you on a journey through the world of psychoactive plants and alternative wellness, all while delivering the real, actionable insights you crave. I'm your host, Christina Dees. This is my lovely co-host, Dr. Amanda Ryman. Dr. Ryman, you know the drill. Why are we here? Well, we're here because there's so much information about cannabis marijuana out on the internet, and it can be really difficult to decipher fact from fiction. There's a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of mistruths. And so we're here to separate truth from fiction. We want to give you actionable insights that you can incorporate into your own life. So think of this as your trusted confidants or advice you'd get from your really cool aunties or kick-ass granddaughter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, curious minds and inquisitive souls, welcome to today's high stakes debate. We are about to embark on a journey through the controversial landscape of cannabis. The question on the table, is marijuana a gateway drug? a tempting stepping stone, or just a leafy rebel with a cause. So let's get ready to roll up the facts, light up the discussion, and blaze a trail through the burning question. Is marijuana a gateway drug? Well, that's a question I get a lot, especially from parents. And it's important to understand the origins of where this idea came from. So one of the things I used to do when I was a professor and I was teaching substance abuse treatment is I would show my students drug propaganda films from the 1950s. And it was really interesting because in all of these films, there was a common theme, which is that one day your student, child, teenager was offered a joint and would smoke a joint. And the very next day they were getting injected with heroin. And this was really scary for parents because even though they thought that marijuana wasn't that bad, they definitely didn't want their kids moving on to more serious or harmful substances. And so the idea that it doesn't stop with marijuana, that marijuana is just the beginning, and that in fact, the use of marijuana itself causes you to want to use other substances was a really, really powerful message at the time. Okay, so it sounds like this idea of marijuana being a gateway drug, it started long before D.A.R.E., which, by the way, I was D.A.R.E. top student um, long ago. You as well, see? That's why we're here doing our thing. Um, So (laughs) is there any truth to this claim at all? Well, it's a little bit difficult to describe. So there's a difference between what we say correlation and causation. Correlation means that two things are associated with each other, and there could be all kinds of reasons for this association. Causation means that thing A causes thing B to happen. And there's a lot of confusion, especially in the substance use world, about the difference between correlation and causation. So this is what we know. We know that most people who use more harmful substances used marijuana before they used those substances. Now, what this usually means is that one, marijuana was the drug they were offered first, that two, it's the drug that people are most likely to use, especially as younger people, and three, that they were likely exposed to these other drugs, not because of marijuana itself, but because they had to buy marijuana on the illicit market. So when you go into a dispensary or a marijuana store, they only sell marijuana. That's all you're going to find there. You're not going to find any other drugs. You're not going to find alcohol. You're not going to find caffeine. You're just going to find marijuana. But when you're buying cannabis in the illicit market, it's a very good chance that the person that's selling it to you either sells other drugs as well or knows people that sell other drugs as well. So the exposure to drugs beyond marijuana has less to do with marijuana itself and more to do with the context in which people are experiencing marijuana on the illicit market. Now, just because people have access to marijuana first, just because it's most likely to be the drug that they try first, doesn't mean that there's anything inherent about marijuana itself that makes someone move on to use other drugs. And this theory has been studied in research, it's been published on, and what they've found is that, yes, there is an association between using marijuana and using other drugs, but there is no evidence of causation. And again, that association is really more about the environment in which marijuana is purchased and used in a prohibition environment, in prohibition market. Hmm. So do we know why some people go on to use other drugs after marijuana and some don't? Well, one thing that's important to point out is that very few people who use marijuana go on to use other drugs. When you look at the incidence of marijuana use in the U.S. versus the incidence of heroin use, cocaine use, methamphetamine use, 
there is so much more marijuana use than there is use of these, these other substances. And if marijuana caused you to use those other substances, we would expect to see similar rates, right? We would expect to see people use marijuana, then they use something else. And that isn't what we see. So what does put somebody at risk for using other drugs? Well, according to the research that's been done, there's a few things. One is age of initiation. So trying marijuana usually happens around the age of 16, 17. That's kind of the normal age of experimentation. Now, if somebody's using marijuana at age nine or 10, that puts them at a higher risk for moving on to other drugs. And then also begs the question, what was going on in that child's life at age nine or 10 to where they did not have the parental oversight to prevent them from using marijuana. A 16, 17 year old, you can understand, they're at parties, they have their own car, they can drive, they're kind of independent of their parents. But at nine or 10, your parents should know what you're doing. So it calls into question that environment. Another thing that can impact this is the order in which people experiment with substances. So kind of the natural order of things is for people to use sugar, then caffeine, then nicotine, then alcohol, then marijuana, and then some people go on to use other substances. But if you skip steps, if you start with caffeine and then move on to methamphetamine, for example, without trying alcohol, without trying marijuana, again, it calls into question other things that might be going on in your life that might compel you to use something that is more intense than marijuana. So that can also put somebody at risk. Um, and so it's really this that plus the exposure to the illicit market that might encourage somebody to move past marijuana uh, onto other substances. Although I do think it's important to mention that even when we're talking about the so-called harder drugs uh, like methamphetamine, like opiates or heroin, uh, like cocaine, many people who use these substances use them non-problematically. So something you'll hear me talk about a lot in this series is that all use is not abuse. And that's true with alcohol, that's true with marijuana, and believe it or not, it's true with things like methamphetamine and cocaine. Huh. Well, I love that you shared the order of experimentation. I actually did not know that. Um, but don't most people try alcohol before marijuana? Yep. Most people try yeah. alcohol before marijuana. Most people try nicotine before alcohol. So, you know, smoking a cigarette. Uh, usually that happens around the same age, like 14 years old, uh, 15 years old. And then most people try caffeine. Uh, before they try nicotine or um, or alcohol, right? So thinking about either coffee or Red Bull, right? How many kids yeah. or young teens do we know that drink Red Bull? And if you want to go back even further, sugar is really the first substance that we use that both causes a chemical reaction in our brains and in our bodies, causes withdrawal, has a period of a rush followed by a period of crankiness. If anyone's ever given a child a lot of sugar, you see they get really excited and then they get really sleepy and cranky. Um, that is due to the chemical reaction in our body. But something that's interesting is that there's a theory that human beings have an innate desire to change their perceptions, that that's just part of being a human. And the evidence for this, which I always find fascinating, is watching a young child spin around until they get dizzy and fall down. So we've all seen this, right? I don't do it much as an adult because I get dizzy way too easily as an adult. But you know, little kids, right? They'll spin around in circles and then they'll fall on the floor and they'll be laughing hysterically. It has been suggested that this is evidence that even as young children, we are seeking ways to change our perceptions of the world and to get that kind of intoxicated feeling it's just as a young child, dizziness is kind of the closest thing we have to that feeling. Wow. Well, this was a very enlightening episode. So thank you for sharing all of that. You know, as we wrap up today's plant power journey, remember to hop on over to our YouTube channel for an extra sprinkle of herbal wisdom. You know, it's like a garden of knowledge that keeps on growing. You, our amazing viewers, are the roots that keep our plant wisdom thriving. If you've got questions sprouting up or you just want to shoot the breeze, don't hold back. Reach out to us, info at mypersonalplants.com. We're always eager to chat about all things green and enlightening. Until we meet again, stay curious, stay green, and keep those questions coming. All right, 940.